Welcome, everybody. Turn up some lights here because I like it dark. There we go. So, uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. If you're watching on the replay or whatever, uh, I'm going to try and do this in a couple of steps so it makes sense and not just a wild Q&A. But uh, thanks, for everybody, joining live, too. So, as I said, what we're going to do is go over how to make a number of modifications to your base, how to make it more comfortable and how it plays, how to uh, do modifications to personalize it, and how to solve repair issues and things like that. So we're going to take it a section at a time. And this is also kind of the kickoff of the semi-regular series Chop Shop, where I'm going to discuss the things that, you know, repairs and things here. But on Chop Shop, I'll actually demonstrate it and walk you through the different steps. But here we're going to try and problem solve and just go through a number of things, uh, you know, that you may have wondered about and try and help you out with some answers to your questions. So, cool. So, uh, hello to Danny, Ike, Stephen, uh, Rumcore. Thanks for the earlier comment. That's cool stuff. So, uh, to get started, what I'm going to do is, like I said, we're going to go in three stages. Uh, we're going to go into... Uh, improving the feel of the instrument and a few tricks and things that I do to try and uh, solve those issues of just making your instrument better overall. Uh, the other is going to be troubleshooting and actually going through, you know, more advanced type of things to get your instrument if you're having problems with it, uh, ski ramp type of problems with frets, buzzing, electronic issues, stuff like that. And uh, Bobby, Alan, good to see you. Steve? Uh, and then we're going to move into doing mods, like I said, really personalizing the instrument. And I've got some ideas that uh, I think are going to help out and probably save you some money, too. So, uh, like I said, I'll be watching the questions, so I may take ideas from different categories. If you guys have questions, pop them up. But uh, I'm going to start in with basically what to do, what I do, because I'm modifying a number of my bases right now. i got some new stuff in the door. So I'll kind of tell you what my stages are when I first get a base and start to do stuff. Uh, one of the big issues that I deal with, Alan, good to see you, is a lot of the bases that we're getting, unless you're buying pretty high-end instruments, are usually imports. And one of the big things that I deal with a lot is almost every import made guitar or bass that I pick up anymore has what we call fret sprout. And that's due to a couple of factors. One is that we're getting guitars from overseas that are going through wild weather, temperature, humidity changes, all this type of stuff by the time it gets to you. And the other is, is that I have a strong suspicion that the wood they're using over there because they're producing so many guitars just isn't drying or getting seasoned well enough. One way, and you may have noticed if you watch the channel, I've gotten around this to a little bit to, of a degree, is I usually buy, if I buy an import, a guitar that has a binding around the neck. And I should probably backtrack a little bit. Basically, what fret sprout is, is the wood on the guitar, as it dries out, starts to shrink, leaving the fret poking out the sides of the neck. Like, I have an unfinished base here. So, as the fingerboard starts to shrink, the fret doesn't because it's metal and you wind up with these jagged things on both sides of the neck. And if you've dealt with a particularly bad version of it, it can be pretty painful. Uh, you know, ripping your hand up and down the neck, that type of thing. And it makes it uncomfortable. So the first thing I'm going to do is if I have that problem and my guitar doesn't have a binding, because again, having a, a plastic binding on the fingerboard, helps alleviate some of that because it digs into the plastic before it gets to your hand. Uh, so what I would do, and these aren't the files I recommend, I actually realized before we went live, I loaned out my uh, my jeweler's files, but you can get files about this thick. Get them at hobby stores. If you really want to get serious, like Stuart McDonald, of course, has sets of them. But if you're just doing a guitar once in a while, just getting a hobbyist set of like what they call needle files sometimes, things like that, very slim ones. I'm going to use a wider file just to kind of make the point, no pun intended there. But basically, I'm going to come up to the edges, and you'll look on the edges of the frets, and they have a downward slope. It's just match that and take them one at a time and just grind them down a bit until they match the edge of the board again. That is a huge step that 
can make a massive amount of difference in how your instrument feels. Uh, yeah, Ike, it's it's been a problem for a while. I, I find it's been getting worse with import instruments. Uh, so just doing that, one, is going to add to that smoothness going down the board. And to follow that up, one thing I do with every instrument I get, that, you know, pretty much across the board, is I take the edge off of the fingerboard. And this is something that's done with a lot of kind of custom instruments, but when you're getting an import or a mass produce instrument, they don't generally do this step. And it you don't if you've never experienced it before, sometimes you don't realize this is why older or vintage instruments are sought after so much or why they feel the way they do is because from years of playing, this edge on the fingerboard, right where you know the top goes 90 degree down. On most new instruments, it's really sharp. They don't do anything to break that angle, but over years of playing, you know, your hand sliding up and down here, you get that eventually wears away and you get that very smooth kind of feel, which just introduces this. I'm gonna be doing on Chop Chop a number of things with this bass. I got a completely unfinished Cirrus 6 and I've started placing things already, the bridge and the tuners. But I'm going to show how to stain it. I'm going to do some treatments to the neck. But the way to get around this is real simple. Get yourself a razor blade. You know, try not to cut your hands off on this. And I would just take the guitar about like this so that the sharp angle is pointing this way. And then just take the razor blade and usually do this with the strings off. I'm not going to do the whole thing because I also don't want wood shavings all over my studio. But just go up and down the neck like this and gradually kind of rotate it. Start breaking the edge immediately and then do it this way and this way, kind of rocking it back and forth. And that's going to break that edge. And you do it until you're happy with it going all the way up and down the neck. Just giving that, breaking that edge on any fret sprout and rounding this, you'd be amazed at how much better a bass will feel. Because think about it, your hand is doing this. It's making contact here all the time. And even up here, your hand is moving all the way up in there, having a smooth rounded line with no contact on the frets. It's just going to make it sound and feel that much better. Well, not sound, but you'll probably sound better when your hands aren't getting shredded by fret edges all the way up and down the neck. So this can make a massive amount of change in immediately the playability. When I get a bass in the door, if it's not an older instrument that's already had some of this or even some of them have some fret sprout, the first thing I do is go through those initial steps and, you know, break this down and make it as comfortable as possible. Then I start escalating in what really needs work. So, those type of modifications are what I call the playability ones, things that make even a cheap instrument feel like a slightly more expensive one because it's been made to feel like it's broken in a bit and that more attention to detail has been played. But Danny, sharp fret edge makes you want to not play any given instrument. Exactly. It's, uh, I actually got a guitar recently that was shipped to me brand new and it was so bad, it was the only guitar I'd ever sent back. I just went, it's gorgeous. It plays, you know, if I hold my hand out, it actually plays well, but the fret sprout was so bad. I just went, this, this is unplayable. Like I was literally had cuts on the inside of my fingers from it. Uh, but yeah, like I said, it's two very simple things, things that you can't really mess up that bad unless you get like a, you know, grinder and go at your frets or something. But again, slim needle files, you can get them at a hobby shop or something. And, you know, you're not taking off that much stuff. You can listen to a podcast or just, uh, you know, whatever you do, turn on the TV a bit and just cut each one of these down. Like this is going to need a little bit. I can feel it up here. Down here is not bad. These frets are going to need it. Uh, hey, Jimmy. Good to see you, man. Uh, and like I said, rounding over that fingerboard, both sides. And the best part is, is that it adds a bit of what I call youism to something. The amount that you round the fingerboard is really up to you. So it's really getting your feel at something that's not destructive. You're not going to you know, tear the fingerboard off or anything. 
Some people like just a little bit of a break there. Some people like really rounded ed edges. Uh, I tried one recently from a company called Devon Bases, where he rounds over the fingerboard to the point like I've never seen anybody do it. And it's really an interesting feel. I thought that was really cool that he just went whole hog with it and much further than most people I feel. And yeah, I mean, it, it had a different feel from a lot of necks. It may not be your preference in overall neck contour. I enjoyed it. But man, the sides of that fingerboard were fantastic. It was like playing on glass. So you get to individualize it. And to me, that, at least for me, that's an important part of really owning an instrument and feeling at home because I don't look at the fingerboard a lot. I play a lot by touch. And especially since I have to do lead and vocals and stuff, I have to know where I am. And having that smoothness and just, you know, you start to get a little sense memory, you start knowing where you are all the time. And having as smooth and as delicate a feel as possible, it really makes an instrument not only a level up, but yours in a way. And I always like that kind of vibe. Uh, Husky Needle Files from Home Depot. Even gave the part number. Thanks to Ike for that tip. You guys, uh, if you're going to grab a set of files, good deals there. And you probably have a Home Depot close to you if you're in the U.S. So jump on that one. Thanks, Ike. Good suggestion. there. So now we're going to talk about the overall setup of the instrument and really getting it dialed in. And we're going to solve a couple problems here. I look at this as being a three-piece kind of adjustment. You have the bridge adjustments. You have the fingerboard adjustments, and you have the nut. The nut is the one we really need to talk about uh, at one point and emphasize it because I feel like that's the one that gets left behind, usually because people are afraid of the permanent kind of level of once you adjust the nut, you're done. It's If you make a mistake, that's kind of screwed up, but we'll talk about some ways to get around that. Uh, Hoffner ignition base, no threat. The E string sounds dull and flat. It has flat wounds on it. Could that be part of it? Uh, I'll get into uh, having dead spots or different areas and the causes for them in there. So let me make a note of that for you, Jimmy, and we'll get into that uh, when we're talking about mods. But so for uh, the initial setups and doing what I consider the essential exam on a base, like I said, we're gonna talk about the frets, the nut, and the bridge. Now, the first thing is you need to do a basic check. It's kind of like going to the doctor. Uh, if something's wrong with the fingerboard or your overall fret level, everything else becomes irrelevant. You're not going to fix the stuff. Uh, so the most important thing, and one of my, I consider an essential tool and they're cheap, is one of these. Uh, what this is, is a pre-gouged uh, fingerboard level. I've got 34 scale on one side, 35 on the other. And what you want to do is de-string the instrument and adjust your truss rod and sight down the neck to make sure it's as straight as possible. Then you check it by putting this on and looking at the neck and see it's slotted to avoid the frets. Hold it up to the light and that's going to make sure you're absolutely flat because we're going to talk about fret work here. And if you're not 100% flat and you go to start uh, altering the frets, you're going to start screwing things up because they're not level to begin with. So make sure absolutely turn the truss rod, get one of these. Uh, I got one off eBay and I mean, it was like 15 bucks. They're, they're relatively inexpensive and it's an easy tool to have. Uh, yeah, Dem uh, Jimmy, we'll definitely get to that. Danny, yep, we're definitely going to talk about the nut and everything. Geo, always good to see you. So now that we've got, we're going to assume strings are off and we've got the neck level. What you want to do is, and I'll be showing this in Chop Shop, but you can see a number of videos that will kind of walk you through this process, is taping off the fingerboard and marking the frets. This is how we're going to see if we have any high spots. Uh, I can usually judge it with the strings on just because, you know, years of playing and working on bases. I can tell, you know, it, 
I can get the neck really straight and I know where to check and everything and kind of, you know, stalk through the frets and see if I just have one fret that's a problem or if there's a certain area. One way to determine this is you just kind of up the neck and if suddenly one fret just sounds buzzing but everything else feels good, then you can get, you know, again, a small file. This is one I recommend from Stuart McDonald. Uh, I think a lot of their stuff can be overpriced at times, but they have one that you can actually slide under while you're still strung up and just slightly grind uh, that particular fret down. If it feels though like there's a certain range that's buzzing out, that's when we got to start looking in and making some decisions. Uh, so if you find like, and a common one is you get what they call the ski jump, which is pretty much after the 12th fret, you'll get this kind of hump. Uh, more prone on bolt-on necks because of the way the bolts seize the body, it kind of creates this arch here. But I've seen neck throughs that get them too. So what you do is you tape off the entire neck and you put usually I would use black marker or something on each fret. Now you want to get a level. Again, a money saving thing that you can go to a luthier supply and there's nothing wrong with it if you're going to do a lot. But if you're only going to do a little, a way to get around this stuff for just getting a base or two done up, go to Home Depot when you're out getting Jimmy, my man's recommendation here on files and stuff, uh, or Ike's recommendation, sorry, and get yourself a machined, make sure it's machined level, uh, the ones with the liquid in it, because they are machined to be perfectly flat on the bottom. Then get some double stick tape and sandpaper. Double stick tape on that perfectly level surface and sandpaper, you've got yourself everything you need for a perfectly level thing to be able to level your frets. So, like I said, we're going to cover this and I'm going to show you going through the fret process. You can see a number of these. Uh, if you want to see it soon and you've got something you're dealing with that's a problem, I recommend looking up a recent video from Billy Sheehan. Uh, I believe it's called how to make a cheap bass play better. And he talks about his whole way of doing it. He uses a giant file, which to me is a, a bit nuts, but I mean, he's been doing it forever, so he knows what he's doing. I would take sandpaper, you know, in graduating things, if it's especially your first time, and work your way up. But you just take the level and go back and forth, up and down, even pressure, and you'll start to see places where the magic marker's coming off and where it's not coming off. And that means you have low spots or high spots that you, you need to get it so that all that marker comes off evenly everywhere. Don't do additional pressure. Make sure that it's even all the way across. Then you go through what's called the fret dressing process where you, you know, get the shine in, you sand it down. Like I said, more extensive things. And this is covered in a number of videos. But the reason I wanted to get into this is I have an additional trick for you that I use, you have to be delicate with this. But if you're psychotic like I am about micro low action, but having that, as you can hear, I've already done a little work on this. I'm not plugged in, but that's almost silent from fret buzz. And you can see my strings are barely off the fingerboard. I mean, it's almost laying on it. So I did some work on this already. I'm actually gonna get it even lower up front. Now my trick for this, is once I've leveled the entire fingerboard, I tape, you know, literally tape the fingerboard over the frets to make sure I don't sand above the 12th fret. And I do just a couple of extra strokes and a little bit from the 12th fret up so that I get a very slight downward angle at the front. So once I get up here, I get even more clearance. Because when I fret, you know, I'm actually bringing the string level down which is going to work through most of here as you go up and you've got the way your action is set it's going to naturally get higher as you go up even if your neck's flat so that i can set it dead flat and still have a it's almost like i'm adjusting the fingerboard to just barely and i mean a tiny bit cut down up here then that means that i'm going to get that same low action all the way up including when I fret up here. So that's like a last finishing touch that if you don't play as low as I do, 
it may not make a difference to you. And again, this is something you don't want to overdo. You just want a tiny bit of extra touch up in here. But uh, that's a way also of counteracting ski jump if you have it to, you know, you're going to have to level a different, a little bit up here, but that's getting into a deeper thing. But just getting consistent, super low action that feels the same here as it does here, a little bit slighter from the 12th up, just a couple of strokes getting in there will give that final polish to make something just be flawless up and down the neck. So that's a tip if you're already experienced with this or if you're gonna you know, really spend some time with some other videos and try and get this stuff dialed in to really get this set perfect. And especially if you're doing high speed work, if you really want that low action, how to make it just absolutely cherry. Uh, this is a great Billy Sheehan video, other viewers. Oh, good recommendation. I, yeah, like I said, it, he really goes in depth with it. I don't know that on Chop Shop I'm going to do much better, but I kind of want to get overhead and have you guys see how I do mine personally. But his is a great video. Uh, of course, paper. Sometimes the marker just gets taken off the crossfire without it sanding the fret. A good tip, Steve. Yeah, like I said, I'm... I'm talking here in kind of generalities and things, you know, because we're going through a number of steps. When we actually walk through and go through, uh, I, uh, you know, we'll get into more detailed types of things. And especially if it's your first uh, fret thing, I would really recommend against using two cores of paper at the beginning. If you know you've got some teardown work or something, but a lot of you guys are using uh, bases that are pretty well dialed in. They just need a little extra touch. So I'd start with higher grit and spend the extra time going down rather than, you know, trying to haul ass through it right away and do more damage than, you know, might be necessary. Recommendations for what grit to use uh, for the fret leveling. Uh, that's that's something, uh, like I said, we'll get into on Chop Shop, but uh, check out the Stumac video on this one because the big difference being what Rick, what stages I'd recommend for stainless steel versus standard. It makes a big difference. And uh, I'm going to go against some of the logic that people talk about in here, especially when it comes to stainless steel. I know a lot of you guys have picked up Schecter's and things like that, where you have these large stainless steel frets. And whew, man, like it, Using heavy grit may seem like a common thing, but I find you can really gouge. And then if you get a gouge into a stainless steel, it's much harder to correct. So contrary to what most people might do, and again, my methodology, totally open uh, to other advice, but I would go with actually a little bit lesser than some people might on stainless because if you hack it, it it's so much harder to correct. It's the difference in between molding clay and molding, you know, wood or steel. So, you know, when I go to stainless, I usually kind of build in, I'm going to spend more time doing this. I'm going to have to be, pay a little more t attention to it because any mistake or anything, it doesn't go out really well. Or if I create a real grind in something somewhere, it's going to be a nightmare getting it out. So, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, and I think, in Billy's video, he covers some things about the stages of grit and goes a little bit more in depth, and so does the Stumac uh, basic fret work thing. So definitely check out those videos to get a little bit more under your belt if you want to do something before we do the Chop Shop episode on it. Uh, Steve says, using an older piece of paper, 220 to 320 on nickel, takes longer, but good to take it slow and look at the fret tops. Exactly. Couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, 220 is kind of a central thing for me. I use, I keep stocks of it around because I use it on sanding wood. I use it on frets. I, you know, it's just kind of a, a benchmark uh, grit for sanding just to have it around for all purpose work. Now, what we're going to get into next is talking about the bridge. One of my things is that this bridge seems to sit pretty well, even though I have this pretty close down. For getting low action on a lot of bases, unfortunately, a lot of makers just don't set them up that way. They make it so that, you know, if you get vintage bases, it's, I find I almost always have to modify the bridge in one way or another because they just weren't designed for it. They still think of them as upright bases 
and getting really low action starting from back here, you got to adjust the saddles. This one has ones, I don't know if you can see it, we have a bit of brightness, but these black pieces can sink into the body a little bit. And if I don't like how high they are, I may grind them down and get some clearance. So that's an advantage. But if you're going for low action, one of my rules is that if your bridge is all the way dead flat and you're not touching the strings, you got to make a decision there. You either want to swap out for a lower profile bridge that sits flatter because you want to have some angle going across the bridge. You, you want to get your action set so that none of the actual bridge pieces are set dead to the bridge at the height that you want it because you're just out of options at that point. I do this stuff all the time. Sometimes I'll take the head off and I'll take it to my Dremel and grind it down to make the head slimmer, put it back on so I get more play so that I have to turn the screws to get it to come back up. But uh, that to me, especially if we're getting into, you know, doing uh, bases that are set up for fast action and things like that are just going to be tougher overall. It's, you know, we're dealing in microscopic detail. And so getting the right bridge that's going to allow you the right adjustability is something you want to check out right away. If it's not the right bridge, if it's just going to be something that has to be modified too much, dump it and get a different one. It's a bridge isn't that hard to change. It's literally screwing it in and get something that works for you and is going to have the, the right kind of adjustability. Thankfully, this one, like I said, has the screw heads in it. And if I don't like them, I can reduce the size of this black chunk just by taking it on a sander or grinder. And then I've got more play in the screws. So this is where most people tend to stop is they'll get their truss rod done they adjust their neck, they adjust their action, and then if it's not dialed in at that point, it's just, well, that's the way the base is. I say nay nay. Everybody skips talking about the nut. This is crucial, uh, especially for guys, uh, if you're doing metal and things like that, is we're playing up here in first position a lot. And if that nut is too high, then you are really having to press down perfect action all over the neck doesn't matter if you're spending most of your time here and the nut is so high it's holding you off like this one to me is too high i haven't done anything with this yet so there's and i'm going to go over a guide with this this is one reason and i'm going to you know make my case for something i want in more bases uh is i'm a big fan of what's called a zero fret uh, why every good base doesn't use this, I don't understand. But it seems to be making a little bit of a comeback, and you can see companies or uh, designers like Mike Tobias, uh, even Ibanez has started using some of these on their higher-end stuff. <clears throat> but a number of makers have started using them again. And what it is, is it's basically a fret, another one that goes right where the nut is. And that's the one that terminates you to your open string note. The nut actually sits behind that. And what it does is turn the nut into basically a glorified string retainer. It becomes almost irrelevant to the setup of the bass. It makes your setups faster uh, because that fret determines everything. And I'll talk about how that fret gets set up in a second. But like I said, the advantages are it, you know, you can just set up the bass and that that fret never gets modified after you've set it. So it's always dead on. You can switch string gauges. Doesn't matter. You don't have to recut the nut because the nut isn't determining the height of the string off the fingerboard that initial fret is. So that's going to make a huge difference. It also means I've never been able to get action as low and as perfect at the bottom on a base uh, with a standard nut as I had with a zero fret. It just, uh, it, it makes it so that uh, it's almost like I've gotten it to the point where I almost don't feel like I'm fretting. I'm just touching the strings and it's just dead there. And like I said, the, the nut just turns into a glorified string retainer. So you don't have to be perfect at that. And like I said, what happens if you want to do a completely different tuning, different string gauge, you just slap it on, adjust your neck, and you're pretty much there. 
So I'm a big advocate of that. But as most of us, you know, aren't buying bases with that, uh, I'm going to be, and I'm going to talk about it on Chop Shop, but installing something here. I'll show you uh, because you can't really retrofit these because of the size of the fingerboard. It's already mapped up to the point where you would put a fret on to be intonation correct at zero. I found these things, and I've already tried one on a four string, and it went out really well. I don't know if you can see it. There it is, zero glide. And what this is, is a nut like this that you cut, or you can buy them already slotted even, that fits on here, and it has a little ledge where you attach a fret to it, and they supply the fret. So you put the nut on it, you put the fret in the slot, and then you just trim the sides to shape it. And like I said, I'm going to install one on a six string, uh, probably this one too. And I'm going to be doing it to a number of my bases. It gives you a zero fret. They found kind of a way to hybrid it in at the last minute. And that to me is amazing. Uh, the one base that I've done it with so far, like I said, it plays infinitely better right away. So I'm probably going to convert, unless I have a, one that the nut is cut so well for what I do that there is just isn't that much of a point. I'm probably going to switch basically all my bases over to it because one, I like the sound of it. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, the feel of it is fantastic. But the other thing it does is because instead of having a bone or a plastic thing at the end, you have an actual fret that's getting touched when you're playing open. The open notes sound the same as fretted ones. That, that little bit of click that you dial in on your frets Instead of going open and having it sound somewhat different, it always sounds like a fretted note because you technically are fretting. So that I enjoyed a lot too. So uh, that's a mod that goes kind of, we're leaning into mods now, but that's a mod I would make uh, if you're into that type of thing and you really want to get low action. I don't feel like you're going to get it that extra last cherry bit without kind of hitting zero fret. But if you are going to modify a nut, Basically, my thing is, is I press down about here, and like I said, I know it's hard to see, but I look at the distance over the first fret behind here. So as it's coming off the nut, I look at how much play is there right above that first fret. And for me right now, let's see if I can actually show you on the B string, you can see there's a little bit of clearance here. I can actually press down on it. Uh, Rodney, no like. So my thing would be basically I want it to just barely clear that first fret if I'm fretting about the third. So if I'm at here and there's playability here, if I can actually almost fret the string, it's too much. Uh, so that's when I'm going to start. And you have to get the string gauges that you really want to live with. So experiment first. Get it so that you're going to dial it in right and get it so that I'll take a feeler gauge and that's easy to get to. You can get them at Home Depot or something. It's basically just a set of uh, it's almost like how you get Allen keys on a rotation on, you know, a selectable tool. But you can get a set of Allen keys and you want something about the thickness of a credit card. You could use a credit card. Uh, make sure it's a thin one, though, and slide it so that it's about a credit card height above that fret. And what that's going to do is get you right about the clearance that you want. And then for me, I actually will saw into those frets a little bit. I mean, into the nut a little bit just for feel. I'll play, get it perfectly set up, and then I'll just keep popping the string out. And you use these. You get files. Again, you can get these on eBay, stuff like that. And if you can see it, let me see if I can do it but they actually have the gauge numbers of the string that they fit. So like this one, I have one side is a 75 gauge and one side's a 30. So this is for my six string. The 30 is the one I'm going to use for this slot up here. 75 is going to be here. And, you know, it's, it's kind of scooped to be that correct thing, uh, that correct width for the string and make sure it's a snug fit. And then if, you know, if I'm an 80 instead of a 75 or something, I kind of dial it out a bit. But the nut is a crucial part that 
you can have a straight neck, you can have low action, you can have it really well set up, your fret's dialed in. If your nut isn't dealt with, it's for naught, uh, especially in first position. So it's uh, it's really that part that I feel like gets overlooked and for most of people, it's because they're intimidated by it and they're afraid to mess it up. So it's definitely, uh, you know, it's something you don't want to play with or just attack just to do it and not know what you're doing. But at the same time, it's crucial. You can't skip that step and think that you're going to get the excellent setup. That's that's kind of the uh, the bad end of things. There, there's no faking a poorly cut nut if you're trying to get down, you know, to really low action. So let me take a quick second here and see uh, we have a couple of comments here. Yeah, Danny, exactly. The nut just aligns the string if you uh, use that. Or use your own hardware, uh, brass. Yeah, brass or stainless for a nut, whatever you want to do. Half pencil along the fret tops, low as you can cut it. Yep, good comment for Steve. And uh, there's a lot of really knowledgeable people on this channel, which I absolutely love, and you guys are awesome. So by all means, especially on the replay or something, read through this stuff because uh, I can, t I, you know, from having done this a couple of years and known the regulars and things, there's guys giving out fantastic advice in the chat. So check theirs out too. Tons of good tips in here. Uh, JC, yeah, I recommend them. I'm going to actually reach out to them and see if uh, they might want to talk. Uh, somebody from the company that does Zero Glide might want to talk about it or something. Uh, so how was the process to install the Zero Fret? I'm actually going to show it. Um, one of the things, but I'll give you the basics. Uh, like fill up the nut cavity, install the fret. Uh, it depends on if you have a nut cavity or not. But basically, if you have something that kind of cradles the nut, which thankfully most of my bases don't, uh, then you have to modify it and get it to fit right in there so it's flush with here. If you have a nut like this one, you can see there, it's just pl flush up against the fingerboard. So you just pop it out and you put the other one in. And the best part about it is, like I said, if you have a pretty conventional uh, size on these, they actually make them pre-cut. Uh, I prefer to cut my own, but you, know, you can see this one's a blank. But you basically put it in where the nut is, and there's a shelf line. And you want that shelf line. Like I said, it's kind of hard to see on here. I'd recommend checking out the site or something. And like I said, I'll do a guide on going through it. Uh, you can look up their video on YouTube as well but there's kind of a shelf in here that you want to be exactly flush with the fingerboard. And that's because the fret kind of sits half onto here and half onto the fingerboard. It bridges that, uh, it bridges in between where the nut ends and the fingerboard starts. And that's where the fret sits. So you want them to be flush. So it's basically just sanding it until it sinks, you know, flush with those two items. Then you pop the fret on and then you shape it to fit the fingerboard. Uh, my first one took a little bit, again, because I cut it myself and everything. But once I kind of understood what I was looking at and was able to examine uh, the process, my, I know my next one will go much faster because, you know, you have a little experience. I go, oh, OK, I shouldn't have wasted that much time doing this and, you know, ways to shortcut it. But, uh, yeah, it's for me, it's just a it, it's not that much money you can find them uh if you go on reverb and uh you find some places that have them in stock and have your right thing i think they're like 23 bucks if you go direct from the company which i got one it was like 34 i think but they give you like free two-day shipping that kind of thing and uh i called in and asked for a custom one and they were very cool and got it out to me the next morning so uh Again, I don't recommend things or places that I don't kind of have some experience with the customer service and stuff. And they were really cool. So I'm happy to recommend them. But so that's basically the three components. Do you trust Rod? Get your things straight. Examine your frets. Get all that knocked out ahead of time. Make sure that this is clean, dead nuts perfect. Go to your action. Uh, determine the bridge. Uh, I, somebody had a bridge question. I was going to loop back around to here, not to sound too presidential newsroom here. Uh, actually, my own problems. Okay, it may have uh, scrolled up a bit here, and I can't see it anymore. But 
I believe somebody asked uh, recommendations on bridges. It goes completely uh, by the base. So uh, I like I like uh, some of the shallower style that have the roller ones. They tend to get pretty flat, and they have and I like the roller because it gives you string to string adjustability. Those are cool, but really whatever <coughs> you like working with the best is what it comes down to. But just making sure you have an adjustability range that matches yours and it can be tough a lot because I play a lot of neck throughs and you can see the fingerboard is basically laying on the body. So you got to have, you know, a bridge that can almost go dead flat. And at that point, maybe when, uh, at that point, maybe when you have to look at things and this would be a bit more advanced, but possibly countersinking your bridge. So, uh, that's a bit more advanced and that's really gouging into the base, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And what counter sinking is, is sinking the bridge down into the body to get more play. So, you know, so you can actually get those saddles even lower. Uh, so Bobby's asking zero glide for fan fret. Uh, shouldn't make any difference. Uh, it's because it goes right up against the edge of the fingerboard. It's going to be like anything else. A nut is a nut is a nut. So uh, the base that I'm currently developing, uh, I'm going to be doing a zero fret, but I'm also going to be changing up how they're looked at a little bit. So uh, hopefully that'll be a, an interesting innovation. And uh, yeah, it, it should work the same. It's, you know, just because it's angled doesn't mean it changes. So should be just fine. You would probably want to get a blank though, because if you're going to match the angle of your nut being that way, the slots that they're filing are going to be straight up and down. You would want to cut them with the path of your string. Uh, basically, the, the shortcut for me was just taking the nut off that I already have, and I double sticked it to the zero glide nut and cut the nut straight through so that they matched, right? so that the grooves and the spacing were done. That was how I handled it. Uh, Ike is asking individual versus group. Uh, I don't know. That could be kind of a naughty question there, Ike. I'm not sure <laughs> what subject we're on. Uh, I'll go, depending on how much Jack Daniels, group. Uh, <laughs> anyway, hit me with what you're after there. Thoughts on through body versus bridge mounting? Yeah, it's crap. Utter crap. 100% crap. It is the most crap that has ever been crap. It's as if you ate crap and then crapped out crap. It's There is no <laughs> science behind this at all. I've talked about this before. Uh, it's, it, there's there's nothing behind it. There There is no amount of string back here that can create, that creates tension. It, you, you're kind of defying physics with this string through the body thing. All it does is make getting strings a pain in the ass because then you have to account for much longer thing like if i use string through the body on this which has a 35 you can see the winding ends right here so that would pull it over the nut drastically so then i'd have to pay for super long strings it makes no difference you don't hear any of this all that matters is the striking point at the bridge and a string is designed to be at a certain tension to us to achieve a certain pitch if you put it through the body it doesn't suddenly change the physics of the string it, it it makes no sense it really doesn't and i've done this shootout and i might do another one again if you guys feel like it would be interested and you just can't take my word uh i've got a number of bases that have string through options and i've done the ab on them and nobody can tell the difference you absolutely cannot there's no tonal difference there's no tension difference utter garbage 100 percent uh Ike, talking about the bridge. Okay, uh, individual ones, I find they're a pain uh, just I as far as setting them up. I mean, if if somebody likes it, I guess, but I had uh, one of those, I think it was S-Tech on a custom 36 scale Hellraiser from Schechter, and I hated it with the Fury of a Thousand Suns. Uh, just installing it was... I watched the guy at the shop do it and he just hated it. And we actually wound up taking it off and putting a block bridge on. I don't see any advantage to it at all. I really don't. 
Now, uh, if it's your thing, fine. But you know, having to do it and stagger the saddles and uh, yeah, no. Uh, let's see, Stephen. That's what you're noticing on your string through bridge mounting is far more flexible. Yeah, and for me too. It's I know this hardly ever happens, but if you break a string or something goes wrong, I don't want to be fishing things through the back of something trying to set it up. I don't want to, you know, I've had that moment of trying to push things through the back and the strings not poking out right. Now, I don't need any more headaches. Just, just put it in there. For me, the optimal bridge, and this is one thing I look for, is one like this where I can just, this is an ABM bridge. If you can see the bottom, trying to get the light reflection off. I just, I don't have to thread it through either. I'm not a big fan of that. I've always hated having to slide it through things. It always strips the string a bit, rips, you know, grinds the top of it. Something where I just pop the ball in, pull it, done. Like with this bridge, I actually start at the top. I get it to the right length, cut it, insert, do like one or two windings, then pull the string down here and just kind of pop it in, tighten, done. That's That to me is the perfect bridge, so. Let's see any questions before we move to mods. Also makes a pain in the ass because you really have to bend the string hard to make sure there's no stiff spot right in front of the saddle. Exactly. Neck through versus bolt on. Yes. Uh, again, I've been through this before. Um, I like both. They're uh, like you can see hanging up back here. I've got the riot base. It's a fantastic sounding base. Um, it just goes for what you want out of it. I'm going to, uh, the basis that I'm designing, I'm probably going to do both just, you know, just to see which one goes, but there's, don't ever let somebody tell you a really well-crafted bolt-on base suddenly has this incredible, you know, still deficiency underneath of a neck through that's garbage. And don't let somebody tell you that a neck through base has all this horrible stuff you have to deal with or the lack of punch. It comes down to the individual piece of wood you used and how well the craftsmanship is done. Uh, now, this is going to be an incredible gener generality because, as I've said before, each individual piece of wood is different. You can't, and so is the craftsmanship, everything that goes into a base. I've played bolt-ons that sounded fantastic, and I've played neck throughs that sounded like crap, and I've played the opposite way too, sometimes within the same series. But if we're doing a quick thing on mechanics here and a side note, um, overall, uh, I find that neck throughs tend to have a more extended brilliance. It's almost like they have a, a, not a scoop, but kind of like a little bit extended bottom, a little bit extended top. Uh, I find that bolt-ons tend to have a bit more in bite and center mid presence. They pop a little bit. So depending on your overall sound, you know, that could be a guide point. And that's a generality. Again, I've heard, you know, like this bass, I mean, you can't hear it plugged up with no electronics. It's loud as hell and has a lot of mid bite. So everything I would want out of a bolt-on is coming out of this one. Uh, I actually got a different six string recently too that sounds incredible. Uh, has more bite than almost any other bass I have. But the, you know, like I said, the riot bolt on I have behind me, that thing has a grind and an aggression that's just fantastic. I It easily holds its own. So it comes down to expense, how you feel about something, and then that particular instrument. But as an overall massive generality, a little bit more sustain, a little bit more extended range, I find sometimes. And more present mids sometimes on bolt-on. So that's about that. Danny, yes, definitely. Uh, uh, our man Danny here works on guitars. He's a regular on the channel. Really good fountain of information. Uh, and he's building a six-string fan fret, which I will be getting in touch with him about. You know, some of the stuff I'm developing on my own as I get time, because things are nuts. But uh, he's a great resource. If you don't know Danny Gable or see him in the comments, you know, uh, check him out. He's definitely got a wealth of experience here. Glue the top on, get everything routed. Oh, man. So he's killing it here, building a fan fret six string. 
So, so now what we're going to do is talk about mods. And there's one especially that we talk about a lot on the channel. And I'm hopefully going to save you guys some money here, give you an alternative, and talk about you know some a different way of looking at your instrument as far as traditional mods that get done. And one of the biggest ones is, is pickups and electronics. Now, obviously, one of the, the big pains in the butt about uh, doing bass is unlike guitar, there's variables in our pickup shapes and factors. There's, you know, soap bar, there's split P, there's J, there's music man, there's humbucker, there's thunderbird. We have all these ridiculous things and it always seems to never fail, at least in my case, that half the bases that I pick up and I go, man, this thing's fantastic. The pickup I really want to go in, it does not fit that form factor. <laughs> so that can be kind of a pain. But the first thing you want to do, uh, I feel, if you're going to start swapping out electronics is do the research and find how many companies make a pickup that fits into your form factor and then start trying to find AB demos. Uh, like, you know, if you have Bartolini, one of the few that I've seen that make replacements out of the Bartolini, I think it's the M2 shape, is like Nordstrand. Uh, if you're using standard humbucker things, which some Bartolini are too, uh, EMG drops right in. Now, this was originally routed for the PV VFLs. Uh, great pickups, but, you know, like I said, I bought this as a husk, as a project, and I found out that the six-string EMGs drop right in. So that was a grace point, and you guys know I play EMG anyway, but that was really kind of a saving grace. And one of the things that I'll give to, to EMG and to Bartolini and to Nordstrand and a couple other companies is I try and, if I'm going to examine some pickups, try and find ones that are versatile inside of one housing. And what I mean by that is, like, I can get every type of magnet and every com wiring combination from EMG inside of the same housing. I can get a P, a PX, a PCSX, a CS, a J, a JX, a JCS, like, all of them right in the same housing. So that, to me, I try and lean towards bases that give me a form factor that gives me the most experimentability. Uh, it can be a real deal breaker for me if somebody has, you know, something that would take an extensive amount of routing and mutilating the base to fit something in. Not saying if the base plays incredible that I won't do it, but it definitely knocks me back a bit. I'm usually going to lean towards the one that offers me that. And that's the first place I would generally start is especially, and I used to, I encourage this and have talked about it before, since pickups can be pricey or something, I used to go on forums when uh, things were especially broke and desperate, but I still had to nerd out because I had the thirst. I would get with groups of people who were all interested in checking out pickups and stuff. And each of us would buy like two and all in the same form factor. And then we would swap them back and forth with each other so we could all put them in and try them out directly in our base. And then, you know, some guys would prefer one or the other, and we would all kind of settle up with each other and then buy whatever we else we needed to, to do the set. But that for me was a, an initial way of swapping things out to try and find your sound and every possible combination. Like I said, I've always been a fan of the split P combination. I always play double P bases, sometimes P and P, sometimes P and J. Depends on the mode that I'm in. But with these, the thing I like the most about them, and like I said, you can do a Bartolini Nordstrand that I know of just off the top of my head, is I can get like a P here, then put same size, a J, pop that one out and put the P version in, it's the same housing. So I tend towards bases like that, and that's an important part of my decision making. Now, the bigger thing that if you're settled with your pickups and you're talking about modding electronics is we talk about preamps. And, you know, I've talked about like the Aguilar preamp, some of the EMG ones, things like that. And putting those in each base that you have, if you're a psychopath like me and you have a number of them, can get expensive real quick. Uh, the other problem is that you go on it based on what you hope is going to happen. But until you wire it and get it in there and get it into your base specifically, you don't know how it's going to sound. 
then one, it's used. And two, the worst of all nightmares can happen and you go, oh, this wasn't kind of what I was hoping for. So now, especially if you got something like the Aguilar, great preamps, but their wiring is a nightmare. Like it, I'm, I'm good at wiring things and I rip things in and out all the time. And I was screaming by the end of that when it was it, that and Fishman are just, you know, the, the two horsemen of the wiring apocalypse. I don't understand why those things can't be simplified at all. Some kind of quick connectors or something. But then it's also, you know, you sink your money into one. If it doesn't work, you do it into another. Here's something that I've been working on as my own project as far as a preamp and another so that because, again, I'm insane, I don't want the one right one and then try and figure out which preamp works in all my bases. I want every preamp for all bases. I must have them all. So I'll show you something here. Uh, something I did recently, if you saw the episode I did about the Spectre LX and basically the Dean being you know, a, an essential copy of it, uh, was they had the EMG preamp in it, which I like, but that one doesn't have any color to it, which, cool. But because I'm an original Spectre fan, some of you know that the original NS2 had something called a HasLab preamp in it. And that was part of what gave it its really distinct sound, the EMG PJ combo and the, the HasLab preamp. Those are really hard to find. Uh, and I think you can get them through Spectre now, but they're several hundred dollars. And even if you just set something to $200, if you have five bases, that's a thousand dollars in preamps. Nay, nay. So my advice is get one of a preamp that you like and do this. Turn it into a foot pedal. This is a copy of the Spectre NS2 preamp. It's a HasLab circuit. This has been put into a pedal, and I have gain boost, bass mid treble, on off. So now I can plug any bass I have into this, and instead, for the price of one, all my bases can have a Spectre HasLab in front of it. So that means I can try it out with every bass and see which ones I like it with and which ones I don't. I don't have to rewire and unwire and redo it across a number of different instruments, and I always have it as an option. I have uh, a box that has the Aguilar OBB3 in it, uh, and then I'm actually building one that has elements of a few different preamps that I like, and I'm building it inside of a pedal-based preamp so that every bass I have can go through it instead of it having to be put inside of the actual bass and wired just to see if I like it that way. Now, the other alternative for this is, is this also, let, if you would rather have it in the base and you don't want to mess with a foot pedal or it's just not your type of setup, is by doing this inside the pedal, you can at least try it out with all the bases that you have and make sure it's the right one going into the right base. You may be surprised, oh, wow, yeah, I thought the Aguilar would sound great on my Spectre, but it actually sounds better on this PV or on this Schecter. Or, so now you know. You got to try all three of them, and it really shined with this one, and that became your main player and the one you're going to put the extra money into. So you pop the circuit back out of the box, install it in that base, done. It's a way of testing it with every instrument that you have to find out what the right deal for you is. So that can save you a ton of money. And like I said, for me, you know, I have a bunch of different preamps. I have the one that I'm working on for myself. I've got the copy of the NS2. I've got the Aguilar OBP. I've got the EMG uh, BQS series. All of them inside of different pedals. Which flavor do I want today? And sometimes, you know, you want to switch it up. Say you've got your perfect dead nuts. This is my sound. And then you walk into a gig where they're like, oh, well, you know, you have a really aggressive sound. We were hoping for something that's a little more subtle or dialed in. Okay. I can yank the NS2 uh, or the HasLab preamp pedal out, pop in a standard EMG just for a little bit of EQ thing, done, right to the board, I'm all set. So that could save you, I mean, literally, like if you have five bases, well over $1,000, you get a little bit of electronics experience and you either, one, find the perfect base to use with that circuit, or two, 
keep it in that thing and get to use one preamp with all your bases. A money saver from Uncle Rodney because not only is he a psycho, but he's cheap. So let's see. FaceTime. Uh, great videos and information. You were saying with wiring, Alembics and all my bases and their wiring setup is great, but you have to use their pickups. Exactly. So I would look at a way of maybe yanking that assembly out and uh, you know, having just uh, using their pickups and running it just straight volume pan and out and having that wiring assembly in a separate unit. So, Danny, genius. No, uh, well, I'm the uh, the dollar store genius here. So, uh, but yeah, like I said, my basically the, the kind of a, a thing, and I'm going to start showing some prototypes of it, but the preamp I'm building has some of the elements I learned from the NS2 circuit where it grinds a little bit and adds some overtones as you dig in, but I'm adding a mid and I'm going to make it sweepable and I'm going to change the bass and treble parameters. And I'm also going to have a difference in the way the gain hits. So it grinds a little faster and that's going to be kind of my tone. I want to go about refinishing the bass. Finish on my PV grind is kind of wonky. Oh, that's a big area because a lot of different finishes you know, it depends on what you're after. Like what I'm going to be doing with this one is I'm going to be doing a uh, a wipe on poly finish, which is kind of a compromise in between a satin tongue oil type of finish, more glossy like an actual poly spray finish. Not quite that glossy, though, but also sets up a little faster and it is isn't as thick because I don't want a really heavy six string base. So. Uh, I would say look at the effect you want first and then look up guides on that. If you want that whole satin vibe, wipe on satin poly, you know, some Minwax stuff. I've seen people get great results out of it. Uh, and if not, one of the things I used to do for when I wanted just a thick, heavy thing was I would stain my guitar or I would do the prepaint on it and I would find a place like uh, Mako or like one of the old bargain car finish shops pull one of the guys aside tell him hey man spray this for me after hours give him a hundred bucks he'd spray clear coat on it and then i'd sand and polish it at home i uh when i had pointy uh bc rich bases and stuff and played them more often and they got beat the hell on the road i'd sand them down color coat them and take them to one of those guys and then finish the work at home instead of like the 500 dollar, you know uh things that I would get from a lot of people would be like, oh, this has all these corners and everything. They want to deal with it. I do it for a hundred bucks. And that was my approach to that. But like I said, it, it, there's a number of different ways to go. You have to decide, you know, do you want that satin? Do you want the gloss? And there's ways of doing it depending on budget and quality level. So frugal indeed. Think of preamps. Have you tried the Suncoast base preamps? They are built after the Pierce BC one preamp. I have not. And uh, I've heard of them, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. Maybe I should look into that. But uh, yeah, the Pierce is a legend, and you yeah, know that's that was Billy Sheehan's secret for ages. You have a dark finish like Nirvana Black on some of the Warwick. Okay, if you're going to do something like that, then uh, you could do really well again with just black stain. Uh, I prefer alcohol based myself; it dries faster, and uh, it doesn't smear quite as bad if you're trying to do two tones or something. Uh, fibings, probably. Black stain that thing. Add a, uh, a wipe on satin poly. Good to go. Mohawk rattle cans are clear. Another way to go. Yeah, you can get these guys that'll, uh, uh, if you don't have a spray booth or something, they'll take catalyzed poly, which is you know kind of the heavy duty stuff, and put it into cans so that you can use them like that. So, see, again. Good advice from the crew here. Danny's got a lot of knowledge. Looking about pre's. Have you tried Broughton Audio SV Pre? I have not. There are about, like I said, a billion pre's out there. I don't know how many I'll get to, but uh, I can't resist one. Uh, on that note, a little preview into something that's coming up. Uh, I'm going to be releasing another video about uh, the relationship. This is a total side note, but the relationship I have, I'm starting with Guitar Interactive and me doing gear demos with them and how they'll be different from what I do on the channel and that kind of thing. But 
one of the first things they're sending me to check out is that new uh, source audio. Uh, it's kind of preamp, multi effects, you know, compressor, a, a ton of stuff. So that one that just came out, I, I think it's a multi wave. You'll be seeing it here pretty shortly, and it'll be one of my first for Guitar Interactive. Uh, check my YouTube page for the Suncoast when you guys get a chance. Okay, so big time is it Nonfish? Check him out. He's got uh, some info on that Suncoast. So if, especially if you're into Sheehan and his original Pierce BP, uh, what was it, the BC1 uh, that he used to use. I know there were some modifications for it too. Apparently my man has the inside info on it and some stuff there. So check his page out. Good stuff. So uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the importance of strings. And people don't think about this a lot as far as the customization. They think about it from a tone thing and do I have the right tension for playing in Q minor or whatever they're doing. But strings and your gauges and materials can make a huge difference in the playability of the instrument. And I find that only a few people seem to look at it from that angle. That along with your tone, part of your tone, it does come from your hands. It comes from the way you attack things. And while you may have an attachment to a certain string, if you say you want a little bit more looseness, some pull, because you tune up a bit, like you're in standard tuning, and you also like digging in a little bit more, you want to be able to, you know, get in there and yank a bit, then you want to go for a more round core string. And that's going to affect the entire setup. If it's looser, then when you put it on, your neck is going to do this. It, you know, will actually kind of arch like that. Because, you know, less tension means it's not pulling as hard. It's not going to bow down. You know, tight strings make your neck do that. Softer strings make your neck do that. So incorporate that into it. How do you like the neck to feel? And I would say sacrifice a little bit of tone a lot of times for a correct feel. Uh, <clears throat> like, I, you know, I've been uh, experimenting a lot with gauges lately, and I've found that the same gauge doesn't work on all my bases for me. That there's some because of the thickness of the neck, things like that, I compensate with the strings. Like if I have a beefier neck, I'm actually more likely to go to slightly lighter gauge strings. Not a radical change, but if I'm using like my bottom two or say 135 and, you know, 107 or something, I might go to 130, 105 or even 130, 100 on a thicker neck because then it just starts to feel too massive and like I've got too much under my hands. And it gives me a little bit more, I can dig in some, I can pull the notes a little easier. And it's kind of proof positive of what I've said before about that, 35 scale, 34, 37, it's not always a predictable thing of how the gauge is going to feel. You know, that 34s can, can feel and sound absolutely amazing. So if I've got a 34 scale that feels great and plays right, then me putting, you know, a, a slightly heavier gauge on that, and it's really loud and resonant, may sound just as good, if not better, probably, than a 35 where I'm using lighter strings. So incorporate that stuff into it. Start with your strings. That's kind of wrapping us all the way back to the beginning. All this other stuff is contained in what happens with your strings. You put them on, that's going to determine your action height. It's going to determine where your truss rod sits and how you have to tweak to get it dead flat. It's going to determine your nut slots. It, you know, everything you do, it's going to make a big difference. Start with your strings and you know, it's funny that a lot of people just have a go-to, and my thing is, if you really have a particular sound, great. I usually will go with four sets if I start to experiment. I'll go with slightly heavier, my usual gauge, slightly lighter, and then one of a different material. So if I use all stainless steel, I'll try the nickel version of it in the same gauge, and then I'll try lighter and heavier on a base I'm utterly unfamiliar with. Try those out. And the one that hits and it's the magic combination, then I dial the rest of the bass into it and make all my adaptations to set for that. There's a reason why uh, when you get a plec, which uh, if you're not familiar, a plec machine is one that 
uh, dials in, it does the fret job for you by computer, but they make you pick your string gauge and maker, like you have to give it to them, so that it sets up perfectly for that gauge, that material, all of that. And <clears throat> there's a reason, because the computer is going to base all of its measurements and everything off of your string tension, height, all of that. So start with your strings. They determine all your other calculations. So put a little bit of money into it, you know, make sure that's right. And that's going to make a big difference on everything else you do. So don't forget that step. Build your setup from the bottom. Pick your strings. Get your action height where you want it. Measure it out. Write it down and get gauges so you know exactly where it's supposed to be. Deal with your bridge. Deal with your nut. Shape the sides of the fingerboard. Check out that fret sprout. Going through these steps will give you a base that plays so, so much better. Absolutely guaranteed. Uh, Stephen Becker, is getting a Plex job worth the money? If you don't feel like screwing with things and you want it done quickly and uh, like if money matters less to you than either learning the setup or really spending the time to get it dialed in, sure. Uh, I've played putt bases, play great. I think a Plex job right about now is about 250. So for me, a really skilled luthier who would take all this stuff into account and do this for me is better. Or for me, I'd rather, like I did, just learn everything so I don't have to pay that every time. But if you don't like to screw around and if you want this thing dialed in absolutely perfectly, I see nothing wrong with it. Yeah, getting in the Netherlands, getting an instrument plucked is hella expensive. Yeah, and that's the other problem is that the places have to have the machine. So, you know, it's it's not like they exist around every corner. It, you may have to ship your base. You may have to be in a waiting queue. You know, it, there's a lot of things that determine it. If there's a guy down the road that has a plucked machine and can toss it in, yeah, I might do it if he was cheap enough to save me some time. But if I got to ship it and it's 250 bucks, and all this other stuff, uh, I don't know. Drive three hours to the nearest Plex machine, too. Yeah, so there's that. Uh, for me, because again, I'm the frugal guy, I like doing it myself. And again, especially if it's a new instrument, don't hope, know that it's going to need work. Every instrument, these are organic. They need work over time. So if you can make those micro adjustments as you go, that to me is more valuable. And uh, if I didn't mention it earlier, like I said, especially when it comes to frets, don't attack jobs that don't need to get done. That's, that's probably going to be my wrap up advice is I love to nerd out. I do a lot of stuff. I'm kind of a perfectionist about things. But I've also seen guys who do stuff just because they want to feel like they went through it or they did it. Like this, you know, this Cirrus actually has a really good fret job already. So I'm probably not going to do a full mask off and do all that. What I'll probably do is dress it a little bit from the 12th fret up, buff and shine, do all that type of stuff. And I'll leave it there. There's no buzzing frets on it anywhere. If you have a bass that plays fantastic but has one note on the G string or something that's just honking out a bit, get one of those Stumac files that, you know, kind of groove with the fret, and you can do it while it's still strung up. Just knock out that little bit and dial it out and just do that. But if you've got one buzzing fret, don't attack all your frets. There, there's no need for that. Save it for nerding out on your preamps or that type of thing. But... Like I said, it's for me, it becomes it becomes a meditation and I kind of bond with the instrument at that point. When I do something like this, I'll write out my list. I'll sit there and go, okay, what's gotta happen here? Gonna try the strings. Eleventh fret needs a little bit of work. Gonna try that and then look at the rest of the frets. Uh <clears throat> not happy with the bridge. Gonna grind down the B and E tuners to get more play out of it. Uh nuts cut too high. And then make the decision. Do I want to use one of these zero glide things? Do I want to recut it myself and just go for that? See what I want to do there. Okay, then look at the stain. Like this, I'm going to you know, custom stain it and finish it. What colors do I want to do? Let's try some experiments. Let's do, you know, get my whole process sheet down. And then usually I'll pick a day and it's, you know, PV Cirrus day. I'm going to sit down, tune out everything else, turn off the phone and spend like four hours 
just going over this bass and it just becomes a meditation. And at the end of it, I pick up that bass the next day and I just go, oh, this is, you know, this is now made for me. It's my bass. And uh, that's a great feeling. If, if you've been a player, I mean, our instruments are our lifeblood. And if you played for a while and you're always playing what other people's best idea of something is, and you've never had something that plays like it was basically meant for you, it's a revelation the first time you do it. So, but so I hope that answered some questions. I hope that helped you out and we got around to some things. Uh, and I hope it saved you some money and some time and that your bases improve. Uh, what I'd love to see is, especially in the comment section and stuff, you guys share some ideas or little tips. Are there shortcuts to things that you've done? Are there ideas you have that we didn't touch on or things for another live stream or for Chop Shop? I'll definitely make a note and see about bringing them up. Uh, and do you feel like any of these pieces for you weigh more for you than they do, you know, the order that I put them in? Let's talk some tech stuff. Let's uh, nerd out for a little bit, and I will see you below in the comments. Thanks, as always, again, to all you guys for showing up, hanging out. I genuinely appreciate all of you. This was a lot of fun, and I'm trying to do the live streams for the main channel uh, on a more regular basis, especially with the new things coming up. So some announcements coming up this week, and I have uh, two videos coming out, one on uh, things to look out for on the channel and understanding how a couple changes are coming as far as uh, the relationship with Guitar Interactive and how content's going to be shared across those platforms. All right? So, you guys are awesome. Thank you, guys. Jimmy, JC, Ike, all you guys, awesome and great information. I will see you in the comments. You guys have a great weekend. Or a great beginning of the week. To me, it's the weekend because I work. So, take care, guys.